Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and today's video is another part of our dermatology series. We will talk about streptococcal skin infections. It's quite a bit to talk about, so let's not waste any time. Streptococci are gram-positive bacteria that can live in an environment that does or does not contain oxygen. They are usually found in pairs or chains and are physiologically found on the skin and mucous membranes. When they are in a certain range, they are harmless for the body, but if they overpopulate the mucosa, they can lead to a series of disorders. Here is to note that we differentiate three types of streptococci depending on their ability to lyse red blood cells. The first type are alpha hemolytic streptococci. They can partially lyse erythrocytes, which leads to the formation of a green film on the petri dish. Beta hemolysing streptococci can completely lyse red blood cells, and gamma hemolysing streptococci cannot lyse erythrocytes. Another way to classify streptococci is depending on their cell wall components. This classification we call Lanzfield classification, which divides streptococci into group A to Q. Thematically most relevant group is here group A, the beta hemolysing streptococci. Lanzfield group C and G usually affect elderly or chronically ill patients. Another thing that might be important to say is that streptococci are transmitted by small droplets, which are given from one person to another by sneezing, coughing, speaking or even singing. Also direct contact with an infected wound is a possible way of transmission. Also mothers can infect their babies during birth. Today we will talk about diseases that streptococci can cause in the skin. I just want to note here that also in the throat, middle ear, sinuses, lungs and heart valves, streptococci can be the culprit of diseases. But now to the skin. We will talk about every of the diseases specifically. I just want to mention them beforehand to give you an idea about the significance of this topic. Streptococci can cause impetigo, ectuma, cellulitis, erysipelas and necrotizing fasciitis. In systemic streptococcal diseases like scarlet fever, streptococcal toxic shock leg syndrome, allergic hypersensitivity, psoriasis and pustulosis acute generalizata, we can also observe skin manifestations. Impetigo is the first disease we will talk about a little more detailed. It is a common acute superficial infection. The skin presents with small pus-filled blisters called pustules and also with crusty wounds in a yellowish-orange color. If the infection proceeds and the skin forms an ulceration, we call this ulcerated empirical ectima. It is most often caused by group A beta hemolytic streptococcus pyogenes and also by Staphylococcus aureus. The bacteria attach to small wounds and proliferate there. Most often children are affected, but also immunocompromised adults can develop the disease. If a patient has a condition that predisposes him or her to minor wounds, they are especially at risk of getting impetigo. The disease is usually self-limiting and resolves within two to four weeks. We differentiate two forms of impetigo, the bullous and the non-bullous form. Bullous impetigo is caused by the staphylococcal toxins that make the epidermis sheds, shed its most superficial layer. The bacteria can also invade healthy skin and do not require any trauma. non bullous impetigo requires a minor trauma, which is infected and so develops from a pink knuckle to a pustule and then into a crusty lesion. 
As mentioned already, ectyma is the progressed form of impetigo, more specifically of non bullous impetigo. It develops when the lesion cannot heal by itself and it will form a scar on the patient's skin. As I mentioned earlier, non bullous and bullous impetigo usually heal by themselves. If the infection, however, persists, then cleaning of the wound and application of an antiseptic, as hydrogen peroxide 1% solution, are helpful. In especially immunocompromised patients, oral antibiotics can be necessary. They are usually given if the patient develops fever and malaise, or if he has several lesions in the same time. The next disease is cellulitis. It is involving deeper layers of the skin, more specifically the lower dermis and subcutaneous tissue. The skin presents with red, tender, edematous and painful discoloration, accompanied by dimples and increased skin temperature. It is usually unilateral, as it is most commonly associated with a local disruption of the skin integrity. Cellulitis can occur in every person of every age group, but there are a few factors making it more likely to develop cellulitis. Those are, if a patient had cellulitis before, does integration of the skin of the toes and heels, as in for example athlete's foot or due to hard skin, venous diseases, trauma, immunodeficiency, which may be due to a disease or medication, diabetes, chronic kidney or liver disease, as well as factors like obesity, pregnancy and alcohol abuse. Streptococci are the most common cause of cellulitis, Streptococcus pyogenes more specifically, which is the causative agent of approximately 65% of cases, directly followed by Staphylococcus aureus, which causes approximately 30% of cases. The other remaining 5% are caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which will give a bluish-green color, Haemophilus influenzae and Pastorella multocida, which we usually associate with a bite from a pet. Patients are advised to check regularly if the affected area increases in size. Painkillers can be given and the patient should make sure to drink enough water. Antibiotics are given to reduce the spread. Culture of a skin sample is regularly done to make sure to choose the right antibiotic, as some strains can be methicillin resistant or also macrolide or erythromycin resistant. Improper treatment or severe cases can lead to a series of complications. Necrotizing fasciitis gas gangrene or dissemination of the infection to other organs, eventually leading to sepsis, are just a few to indicate their severity. The next disease I want to talk about is erysipelas. It is a superficial form of cellulitis and only affects the more superior layers of the dermis, in opposition to cellulitis, which extended down to the subcutaneous tissue. The predisposing factors are the same as for cellulitis, so for simplicity I will not mention them again. A difference to cellulitis is however the bacteria causing it. Here near to all cases are caused by beta hemolytic streptococci. The onset and development of erysipelas is more acute than in the other disorders. It is a bright red rash with clear demarcation. Some patients present with blistering of the affected area that can lead to necrosis. The skin is usually also swollen, another difference to cellulitis. Also here the treatment of choice is antibiotics, as well as cooling of the affected area to reduce swelling and inflammation. Analgesics can be given to alleviate pain. If the patient is not treated properly, Abscess, gangrene and dissemination of the infection to other organs can be the result. The next disease on our list is necrotizing fasciitis. We know already that it can be a complication of cellulitis, 
But what is it actually? It is the infection of the soft tissues and the fascia, so the, connect the connective tissue overlaying a muscle. As the bacteria multiply, thrombi can form and occlude vessels, which leads to necrosis of the area. The infection usually spreads horizontally, which might not be visible on the surface of the skin. We differentiate three main types of necrotizing fasciitis. Type 1, the polymicrobial type, which is caused by more than one group of bacteria. In this group are usually many aerobic and anaerobic bacteria, and it is most often observed in elderly or immunocompromised patients. Type 2, which is due to group A hemolytic streptococci, and finally, type 3, which is due to Clostridium bacteria, which lead to the formation of gas gangrene. This type is usually following trauma, as for example a vehicle accident, or by contaminated needles. All types have in common that they are caused by bacteria entering the body through a disruption of the skin integrity. This lesion might be as small as a needle stick or large as following vehicle accidents. Risk factors are similar as for the other diseases and also include NSAID use, drug abuse and malignancy. Patients usually experience first symptoms within 24 hours after an injury. They often experience nausea, fever, diarrhea and other flu-like symptoms. After a few days, the affected skin swells and the red rash develops, which later on leads to formation of dark, fluid-filled blisters which necrotize. The patient experiences pain in the first stages of the development of the disease, but later on the peripheral nerve endings will be destroyed, which makes the sensation of pain impossible. Treatment is usually with high-dose IV antibiotics, as the spread of the infection can be significantly larger than visible from the outside. Patients usually have to be hospitalized and they will be given fluids to restore a normal blood pressure. Some patients will require a graft transplantation to cover the necrotized skin area. If the infection has spread to other organs, approximately 25% of patients will die due to renal failure and sepsis. That's it for today's video. I hope it was helpful and if you like our videos, please subscribe. Thank you very much.